Uh, thanks very much. It's, uh, this is a fantastic privilege and opportunity to have uh, time with you, all these leaders in the room. And so I wanted to really set the stage. I, I didn't ask for an introduction because I'm somewhat autobiographical, and I know many of you as well. Uh, but this, uh, I'm based in Toronto. The work we do is, has three characteristics. One is it's all about doing. There's nothing I'll, ta I'll talk to you about that we're not already partnering, including with some of you in the room, uh, to carry out and uh, learn by doing, uh, not research from a distance, but building up the capacity to do something that's never been done before. So that's one characteristic. The second is it's all about whole system change. It's all about not even the district, it's the state, the province, the country. So this is still very practical, but it's got big aspirations. And the third is it always zeroes in on pedagogical improvement linked to collaboration, working at the macro and the micro level simultaneously. So macro, I mean policy level, micro, I mean schools, communities, and districts. So really is thoroughly grounded. I was glad to see I, I uh, have connections with at least four of the 16 here with uh, Terry Greer, who I've worked with for uh, probably 15 years, uh, when it's starting at Guilford, also with uh, Richard, San Francisco, with uh, Chris, and uh, soon with Mark and his colleagues in, uh, in Connecticut. And it's all <coughs> about uh, a combination of things that are making the agenda bigger than even what you represent district by district. So I want to take you through that. I've used this slide to start with. It's really about uh, uh, it's really about leadership at all levels, but I want to enter at the principle, not dwell on it, come back to it, but this is a good way of uh, putting it. I wrote this book last year, about a year ago, I published, to uh, rescue the principalship that was being led into the death valley of micromanagement around instructional leadership. And basically said, this is not the point, there are not enough hours in the day, there are not enough um, possibilities of affecting one-on-one -on -one the improvement. Therefore, the principal has to be someone who leads the group, who not leads the individual, participates. So these are the three uh, dimensions, and they really include your leadership and more. Uh, I, I, I'll say something about lead learning. I ought to also talk about practically what it means to be a system player, whether you're a principal or a superintendent. And uh, I'll le weave in the change leadership skills that we're learning so much about. So on the lead learner question for principals, but it really applies to you as well, we can go to uh, the research, and I don't, I, I actually, if I want to find something out, and because I know quite a few, I have a lot of lines to do this, if I want to find out something about a problem, the first place I go is not to research, but to people who are doing it well, to you. And I say, what does it look like? How do you do it? Then when I understand the practice, I go to research and get some additional insights. And so this is how we came across this one. Uh, the research on the role of the principalship, uh, Vivian Robinson, who happens to be based at, in New Zealand at Auckland, did a meta-study around uh, all the research she could find and looked at what, is the, what are the characteristics of the principal. It has the most impact on stu uh, class and uh, uh, school-wide student achievement. And she found about five characteristics, most of which were predictable, one wasn't. And I'll come to the one in a moment. But the predictable ones were uh, help shape the goals and expectations of the school, uh, help uh, elaborate on the, on the uh, uh, get resources, time for people to work together, all of those things. But the one that stood out, <clears throat> it was twice as powerful in effect sizes, was this one. The degree to which the principal, and here's the key phrase, participates as a learner with staff on moving the school forward, participates as a learner. Uh, and in doing, in thinking about that, think about a principal who comes into year one, does all the good things about vision, goals, resources, et cetera, but does not participate with staff as a learner. By the time that principal gets to year five, they'll know as much as they did in year one. Five times nothing is nothing. You have to participate as a learner, actually, to get this. So we'll talk about that. System players, I'll operationalize it uh, clearly, and I want to actually say, if you've got a fabulous district, as, as, they, as you do, many of you do, uh, that we're seeing today, that's not the end of the agenda. That's about midway through. And system player is someone 
who contributes to and benefits from the system improvement. So let's do the building blocks here a little bit. A school <coughs> that moves from being highly individualistic to collaborative. The teachers, and this happens every time, stop thinking about my kids in my classroom and start thinking about our kids in the whole school. Principals in a district, which are, have lateral connections, which I'll come, to, come back to, lateral learning across schools and networks, as well as good partnership with the district. Principals who are networks of schools become almost as interested in the success of other schools as, as their own in that network. They, in other words, they think themselves of contributing to something bigger. That's all I mean by systemness. A district who is doing well, but is also interested in how other districts are doing in his or her state is another element of this. So system player is, is actually, there's a selfish part to this. Uh, if you're a system player, if you connect practically the way I'm talking about, you actually get better ideas and better allies and better things for your own agenda. And at the same time, you contribute to the slightly bigger picture. Here's what I want to say to you about your work not being done. No more one school at a time. No more one district at a time. I don't care how good it is. It's not good enough if it's only one district at a time. And this has led us to a recent strategy <coughs> And we call it leadership from the middle. And the middle is, uh, depends on the reference point, but if I'm taking the federal level, the middle are the state. If I'm taking the state, the middle are the districts. If I take the districts, the middle are the schools. I'm talking laterally. And leadership from the middle, we, we arrived at this, and we've done a lot of work in uh, Ontario, uh, where we're based for the last 12 years, uh, in uh, making a successful system, a whole public system of 5,000 schools and 2 million students. We're working massively in California. Uh, there's about 10 of us, and we team up locally. That's how I know Richard and Chris and others, because literally we're working with the 1,009 districts in California, one way or the other. Uh, so that this, uh, here's how we came to leadership from the middle. Top-down change doesn't work. We know that because you can't get it right and you can't keep it right from the center. Uh, we also found out bottom-up change doesn't work. School autonomy is the enemy of systemness schooled autonomy by itself. Bottom-up change doesn't work because it was based on the notion that it let a thousand flowers bloom. Well, it turns out a thousand flowers didn't bloom if they're left on their own. If you, and if you're into gardening, those that did bloom were not perennial. They came and they went. So what happens uh, in a system, individual, that, so we came then and said, well, where's the glue here? If you want bigger, sustainable work, where's the glue? And the glue is, and uh, when the middle gets stronger. This is why in several of the states now, we are working with the middle, which are in this case the superintendents, to build up <coughs> the individual quality of the district, the lateral quality, because uh, there are several consortia that we're connected with in California, for example, where there are the 10 core districts, the two that are represented here of the 10. Uh, there's another one we run with three. There's a further one we consult on that have 12. Many, many consortia of districts learning to work together. And the glue comes from uh, that ability to uh, uh, seize the agenda. They have to do the right things, and I'll get to the right things in a few moments, but they have to be able to seize the agenda and be players, not only in their own district, but in their own jurisdiction. And when they do that, you really get some important changes happening. Uh, and not only do they get their act together, they become better partners upward to the state. That's the key part for system change. Better partners upward to the state, and if the state is got its act together, it'll recognize that leadership from the middle is fabulous because it means the middle is doing the work of the state. You don't have to do as much at the state when the middle is so strong. One of the uh, uh, observations we have, and there's a few I'll uh, throw in here, but think about this one. It's a little bit complicated to say more than um, some of the others I want to say succinct succinctly, but it's this that the quality and sustainability of an organization is a function of the strength of its lateral relationships. The quality and sustainability of an organization, whether it's a school or a district or a state, is a, is a function of the quality of its lateral relationships. And this is why when you invest in capacity building, not just your own uh, great role, but building the team and building the capacity of principals and building the collaborative culture that I'll also talk about that we know is most powerful strategy uh, of any of the ones that we can think about. 
And uh, <clears throat> this is why I want to do it. I want to actually praise you and, uh, and uh, 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 undercut your ego at the same time when I say this. Okay, so that's a trick, actually. But you'll get, it's, it's not so subtle when you say it. Uh, as, a, as a superintendent, you need to be there five to 10 years. And your main goal as you build up the capacity of your district is to make yourself dispensable. Your main goal should be make yourself dispensable after five years, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Because you will come and go. You'll, you'll go mainly, eventually. <laughs> but uh, so we can't, count, we can't count on the great superintendent who happens to be there for three years or, or less, or happens to be there for even a bit longer. But if your agenda is to maximize student achievement, but equally important and more important is to build the capacity of the organization to proceed without you. It's not the turnover of, principal, of superintendents that's the problem, it's the discontinuity of direction. And if you can establish continuity of direction, then you've done your uh, job more effectively. I just put a couple of slides in uh, here just in the last, uh, just actually this morning. Uh, I, I was reading a report from uh, a McKinsey report, a short one, where they interviewed leaders in the social sector and said, what are the qualities of leadership in the social sector, not the business sector? And how, uh, what, are the, what are the shortest number of high priorities that you have to have as a leader? And these are quite compatible with what we have uh, concluded. And I want to use this as a reminder of the agenda. And then I'll get into the details in some of our own work. Here's what uh, these uh, sector uh, respondents uh, re uh, said about the key leadership priorities uh, combination. The ability to innovate and implement. To innovate and implement, to get it put into practice. The ability to surround themselves with a talented team. Second one, very powerful. Third, collaboration. The single factor, and I'm going to say uh, uh, in the course of this that human capital is a misguided strategy compared to social capital, which encompasses human capital. We'll come to that. And number four, uh, ability to manage two outcomes. Manage two outcomes means that you have to mobilize the group to do that. This is why we say being right is not a strategy of change. You have to be more than right. You have to be right with the people that you're collaborating with and developing. So these are four, but uh, more interesting, they asked also these same respondents, how good are you and how good are your peers at these four? So that's what we're going to look at now. How good are you? These are self-reports. And uh, this is how it came out. First one, uh, self, less than a third, almost a fifth of the peers are good at this particular quality. They're all below 40%, I think. Talented team, how good are you at developing talented teams? You and your peers. Change leadership needed for these things. Collaboration, the big one for us. How good? Limited use of a strategy that has the most high yield of any ones we know. And manage to outcomes the similar of uh, that. So you get the sense here that change leader, and change leader is what we've been working on, and we've been in the course of uh, what I'm going to talk to you about, linking change leadership with pedagogy, with digital acceleration. That's the agenda for us now on the big scale. So let's look more closely. I mentioned the lead learner, participates as a learner, working with staff to move the school and the district further. So we'll come back to that. Uh, here's uh, uh, change leadership is often uh, not appreciated in the depth. We, we often take the ideas of vision and direction and mobilization as the given part, but the part that we don't get inside is, this, is the subtlety, the sophistication of the process that will get you to uh, be this good. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes. And the process of change, <coughs> we use uh, in our work, because it's so complex, I'm going to say, uh, the worst thing you can do about a complex problem is make it more complicated, right? It's the worst thing you can do. This is why we say that, uh, uh, the, uh, that's why I use the word simplexity uh, from Jeff Kruger, but simplexity is not a real word, but it's a real concept. Simplexity means you identify the smallest number of key factors that you can establish. In our case, usually no more than six. That's the easy part. And then you make them gel. And that's the hard part, with the politics, the personalities, and the pressure. So that's how we have to get this. And so my simplexity definition of change here 
which is actually very powerful, is that effective change processes shape and reshape the quality of ideas as they build capacity and ownership. You can't get capacity and ownership and buy-in up front. You have to do it through the process. You have to have good ideas to start with. And building these two, and you can see immediately, if you have a good idea and a poor change process, doesn't matter how good the idea is, it won't go far enough. If you have a good change process but uh, uh, a, a poor supply of good ideas, it also doesn't go well. And let me uh, give uh, two examples. And I always get my best ideas. Somebody was asking me at the break about uh, the writing being so clear to practitioners. And it is because I more or less plagiarize from you by working with you. Uh, and we do it openly, and I put it in our own interpretation, but it shapes this way. But here's what I mean by this strategy. We were working in, uh, we do work in Australia quite a bit, in New Zealand, and I was working in Canberra, which is ACT, the Capital Territories, for a three-year period with 80 schools. And in one school, the secondary school, Canberra High School, they had introduced at the beginning of our work a peer coaching framework. So they trained three peers to uh, win this quality teacher framework to observe teachers and give feedback. And most of the teachers in the school said to us, we're, this is, we're not interested in this. We don't want, we don't care if they're peers. We don't want them coming into our classroom, observing us and telling us how to teach better. Uh, that's not for us. So that was, what, that was the starting point. They did a good change process. Three years later, when we came back, we do a lot of filming. And incidentally, um, on my website, michaelfullen.ca, Michael Fullen, all one word, you can uh, download uh, this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, YouTube channel, we have about uh, a dozen or so clips of 10 minutes each of, the, of what this looks like in practice. But when I came back three years later and did the filming, everybody, all the teachers, 100% were using the quality teacher framework. They were engaged in it. Uh, teaching had improved, results had improved, great atmosphere, enthusing engagement. And so I sat down at the, at the end of the day with the deputy principal, and I said to him, this is impressive from a change point of view, because we started at the beginning, a lot of people were against it. Now, three years later, 100% are embracing it, including a lot of people, they're mostly the same people, who were against it. I said, what's happening here? And I asked him this question. I said, what's the, is this practice mandatory or voluntary for the teachers? Because everybody was doing it. And he said, without hesitation, it's voluntary but inevitable. <laughs> That's what I mean by that statement. A good idea and a good process, it's inevitable. Except we don't put those together soon and uh, often enough. The other one that's one of my favorite, because uh, it captures it so well, a CEO uh, from one of uh, the uh, very successful companies was re uh, had retired, was at his retirement. They, he was interviewed about his leadership qualities. And he said, the, the, the reporter asked him this question, what's the most important thing you've learned about leadership in your successful career? And he said, the most important thing I've learned is to be right at the end of the meeting, not at the beginning of the meeting. That metaphor is that too. That is fabulous. What does it mean to be right at the end of the meeting? You had a good idea to go in there, but you also shaped and reshaped it with the group, but so that by the end of the meeting, there was buy-in to do more. That's, this, is the, this is the sophistication of the change process, to have both good ideas. Because when you have a, good, really, a great idea and you have moral imperative, you're kind of impatient about people who don't want to uh, jump on, the, on with you. And this is why also we say in our, some of our other change work, you have to learn to practice impressive empathy. We all know what empathy is. Empathy is when you have empathy to it with other people. Uh, is, uh, you understand where they're coming from. Impressive empathy is when you have empathy for people who are opposed to you. That's why it's impressive. You wish they would get out of the way or go away. But you have to really relate to the diversity and work through the ideas. And yes, you take harsh action, and uh, everybody needs to do that. I've worked as 15 years of Dean of Education at the University of Toronto through a lot of um, difficult change. I learned what it was like to be a leader. And these ideas ring true in higher education. The only problem is in higher education, uh, one of my guidelines is this. The higher the percentage of PhDs you have in your organization, the more articulate they will be at the reasons not to change. <laughs> you don't get any more buy-in there either, uh, just a higher level of argument, or so it seems. <laughs> So, leading in a digital age, I did a book a couple of years ago uh, called uh, Stratosphere, 
And I said, these three forces change leadership. I've just given you a taste of that. Uh, pedagogy, which we'll come to, the really great uh, uh, partnership pedagogies that are now evolving, and the role of digital. And I said, these three forces have grown up independently from one another, and you have to put them together to, make, uh, to get results. And when you put them together, you get forceful things. And we're, we're doing that m most of the districts. And when you heard Terry talk about Houston and one-to-one, uh, one the lesson, I hope you, the lesson you got out of that was not that it was digital that was a hero. It was pedagogy was a hero. And they were using digital to maximize it. And that sequence is what we undercut and get in. Uh, when I, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later. I did a paper, and I'll show you the sort of updated frame of it. In 2011, I did a paper called Choosing the Wrong Drivers for Whole System Change. And drivers are policies. Wrong drivers are policies that don't work. So we'll come to that. But one of those wrong drivers I identified out of four was uh, technology. I said, the main strategy that people are using in technology, the main strategy you can also sum up in one word, acquisitions. That's it. Or if you want to use three letters, B-U-Y. You buy it, and then you hope it will work, whatever. That's the full extent of the strategy. And, we'll come, and so when we, uh, we said, that's not the way to go. Digital has a stimulating uh, power, but you have to have the pedagogy. And I'll say later about the sequence between what you invest in centrally and how you have to uh, tie in technology to that. But in this little clip I want to show you, I just want to show that I haven't gone over the other side to digital, even though we work well with it now. Uh, and uh, this is a 30 second clip and I'll make two points. I hope you get both lessons from this uh, little clip we're gonna see. Yeah. Emma. Huh? Emma. 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 Nouveau de trèfle maxifeuille, vraiment plus large. Okay, so obvious lesson number one: that technology can't do everything. Although I'm sure someone will have an app for that before long. Lesson number two, I hope you got this, was judgmentalism is not a good motivator for change. It actually, actually does motivate people to get revenge, but that's not what you want. You have enough on your plate. So what, uh, the reason I'm optimistic now about the integration of pedagogy and technology and change is that all three are getting better and they're getting more connected. And I want to say the agenda is to push the connection. And the dynamic here is in our favor, even though the first part is negative. Uh, the push factors, you could name additional ones here, is that the evidence is unequivocal. Student, with, tra with traditional schooling, students are more and more bored as they move up the grade levels. One of our principals in the filming said, well, actually, teachers are bored too, uh, except they didn't know it as much until we kind of got into the new stuff. And then teachers are additionally alienated because of the wrong policies, which is a wrong driver problem I want to come back to. Policies that uh, put teachers in a position that, uh, that actually don't only motivate a few while it alienates the majority. So that alienates teachers and you lose that energy. Uh, so that's the push side. The pull factor are these three things. I've already mentioned them. Pedagogical partnerships between students and teachers and families, between and among. Uh, digital allure, even though there's the downside, what the, one of the early chapters in Stratosphere, it's only a 100-page book. The uh, early chapter was the dark side of the internet, so there's downsides. But there's also the need to move towards it. Andy Hargraves, who I work a lot with, he and I, uh, in one of our earlier guidelines about something else, we said, if something is going to get you anyways, you're better off to move towards the danger. That's how I feel about digital. It's going to get you anyways. You better move towards it, even though it's not all good. It's a mixture. You have to be able to uh, work on that. And then collective efficacy. Somehow, 40 years of research about the power of collective efficacy compared to individualistic efficacy has not gotten through, except in the recent work we've been doing with some of you. So we'll come to that. Uh, this is just a graph on the on the, that we all know it just jumps out at you a little more when you put it in graphical form. Uh, Jenkins, from the point of view of teachers, how enthused are, you, are your children? 
at each of these grade levels. The graph goes down, down, down until it bottoms out. Uh, if you go to Russ Quelia's work and other work from student voice, it's the same thing. Students say the same. We are alienated. We are not uh, interested in uh, development. And so when we get to uh, the new pedagogy, uh, we're working right now, and so are many of you, independent of the particular project we have, so we, we ha actually get in, in line with you in two different ways. Uh, we have a project called New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. And this is the new pedagogy part. I'll come to the deep learning part in a moment. And the new pedagogies for deep learning, the project, bro the broad frame is uh, having 10 clusters of approximately 100 schools from 10 different countries over th the next three years to work on operationalizing this agenda. These people have come in because they're already either doing this or moving in this direction or wanting to move in this direction. So it's led not by us externally, but by them internally, and we're providing a framework. And these, uh, we can talk about the countries later, but uh, there are uh, uh, various clusters that are now operationalizing this. And I would say that the work you're doing in digital better include this as well. So we have that uh, pedagogical side. And here in Stratosphere, I said, given the boredom, given the opportunity, what are the criteria that the solution have to, has to meet? Which criteria? And I came up with four. And I'm sure you'll agree with these, but I'm talking about the reality of implementing them. Ir uh, that the solution must be irresistibly engaging for both students and teachers. And I'm going to say families as well, uh, because we have, we're late to adding that. But that was very clear in the presentations today. The partnership with families and community has to be in that equation. I agree. Number two, it has to be elegantly efficient and easy to use. This is the technology again. It's kind of the Steve Jobs criterion for me, that you put the complexity in the design of the, uh, of the technology, so you maximize ease and depth of use. Number three, technologically ubiquitous, 24-7. What does that mean? It means the school day is no longer nine to three. It's open-ended. Uh, and some of you have programs to make it more open-ended. And if you look at that closely, you don't even have to be, do a financial assessment to know that if you change in these directions, you double the learning time of students with hardly any cost because the day is used better and you have additional time afterwards that wasn't available to begin with, but is now. Double the cost or double the, uh, the impact at hardly any additional cost. Why? Because students are free labor. Some cost for teachers and enablers, but nothing for students and they all do better as a result of it. And the fourth one is steeped in real life problem solving. The curriculum becomes very different uh, in this, and I'll show you the, uh, some of this when we talk about our outcomes. But here's just an entry point into the pedagogy. Uh, some of you will know John Hattie, who's become, uh, after doing about 20 years of meta-analysis, he became famous overnight about uh, three years ago. Uh, visible learning, visible teaching. So he, you can see his books. And what he did was take all the instructional practices that uh, were well known and calculated by looking at meta research, the effect sizes of these, uh, of these practices. And he has a list of about 150. And these effect sizes, he said, his guideline is if it's 0.40 or below, it's not worth looking at. If it's above that, it is worth looking at. And so you see teacher as facilitator, 0.17, a small, ineffective uh, uh, impact. And in there, you see a couple of uh, digital uh, internet, some, 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 Simulations, gaming, and web-based. And I'm going to say it this way. Larry Cuban has made the same conclusion after looking 40 years of technology. No impact. The reason that those digital elements have no impact on learning is one thing. They were used superficially pedagogically. That's the single reason. It's why we say pedagogy needs to drive digital, not, not try the other way around only. So that's important to know. There's some other thing in there is that What's embedded in facilitator really is the, the kind of misdirection of going from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. The guide on the side is a poor pedagogue. It's too passive. You have to be, have a more proactive partnership from, from teachers, and teacher as activator gets closer to that. That just happens to be his initial list. They're probably the right, some of the right initial ones. We're adding to that now. What are the most powerful constellation of pedagogical things you can do? It certainly has to do with increased agency on the part of students and families among themselves and between themselves and the school. So uh, if you think of the students, uh, some of you said this today in your remarks, uh, we, I've 
we tr this is our simplexity diagram. Say all the things that students could do, yes, they should be involved in decision makings in the, in the school and that's okay. But close to the individual student, each and every one of them are the three my's. The three my's are my learning, how do I like to learn, and what are, how do we refine that? My belonging, the biggest one, we heard it again today, the sense, to, the sense which people, students have of, does anybody care for me? Do they care if I show up? Do they want me here? That sense of caring. And then my aspirations, uh, what, where are my expectations for life? All three of these are not fixed variables. They're alterable by, put, by focusing on them as strategies to change. And this has huge leverage, another high leverage example. Here are our outcomes that we work with, uh, these six. Uh, three, four, five, and six are the, I guess I'll say, now the, the uh, age-old 21st century learning skills that we've never done much about, but now we can, so they're the, they're the ones that, uh, that in it. remember, our model here, our action here, is to define the pedagogy in relation to these outcomes and create it to happen and assess it and do more of it. It's always got to be measurable impact on outcomes before we consider it important. <coughs> of those four, I guess you could say that three, uh, three, four, and five are kind of in the curriculum now uh, in pedagogy. That is, we do work on communication, critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration. Uh, not much on uh, creativity, as uh, uh, Ken Robinson says. Uh, it's not, it's, it's there, hardly there at all. So that at four years old, uh, a child asked 200 questions. At eight years old, the teacher asked 200 questions. So that's the evolution of, into the curriculum. And the two we've added are very important in terms of citizenship, character education. Character education is grit, conscientiousness, whatever. We have rubrics for all of these. That is, we are operationalizing all of these and we're creating them by working with school systems. We have about 600 schools out of our thousands so far, but you are doing it as well. And this is a gold mine of new information because uh, this is, it's not like it's all been done and all we have to do is implement it. We have to create this on the ground. This is a lean startup proposition. Do it, refine it, learn from it, get better at it, and roll it into rapid change. And I was uh, listening about how, uh, uh, came up today how quickly, how much we need to be in a, in a hurry to get this agenda because it's so, such a, a crisis. And the answer is, and I, I think uh, if Terry didn't say it this way, this is what he would have meant had he said it this way. Uh, the answer is this. You need to go, flat, uh, go slow in order to go fast. You need to go slow in order to go fast. What does that mean? It means at the front end, you've got to spend a little bit of time on building relationships before you accelerate. That's all it means. Uh, you can't do it the first week. And if you leave it go, inertia. So that sense of hurry, you just have to bite your tongue a little bit. And as you build relationships, because you know you're going to accelerate, and if you've done it right, you will accelerate with the group, and you'll go a lot faster than what if, had you done this more directly. Uh, here's what I think these six C's mean. The educated student, point of the, producing great citizens for tomorrow by becoming great citizens today. I know it sounds like a slogan, but actually it's the reality of this work because these students, the 10-year-old the who's doing the six C's, there's no distinction between living and learning for that 10-year-old with his curriculum. No distinction whatsoever. And that this, is, uh, uh, th that this is why it's so powerful, it's so fundamental. It goes back to John Dewey 100 years ago when he said education was not preparation for life, it's life itself. And that's what, it, there's no distinction. And that's how you produce great citizens, not by the graduates, but by building it in early. And they become great citizens on the spot in order, and they end up being even greater in, in this. So I mentioned the right drivers, the wrong drivers, the 2011 paper, and I just want to give you this as a frame. Uh, the, right, the wrong drivers are down the right-hand side. Remember I said a driver is a policy that doesn't work as a driver. So external accountability does not work as a driver. It can tighten things up, it can get some results in the short run, but you win the battle and you lose all the wars with external accountability as your driver. Same with individualism. I'm going to talk about that in relation to our professional capital. It seems rather strange that investing in human capital is not a driver. And we're, I'll give you a little bit of chance to uh, react. We'll have maybe 15 minutes uh, at, at, and that, that we'll, while we're still here together in this hour. 
Uh, so individualism compared to collaboration. Digital, I've already mentioned that, and the others. So notice I put not versus, but vis-a-vis. Vis-a-vis -v means you take it into account. Internal accountability, uh, I used to have capacity in that one, but the best formulation, Richard Elmore, 12 years ago, said it this way, no amount of external accountability will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. Internal accountability is when you build collaboration and seriousness that the group is self-responsible and is transparent to the outside and is kept self-responsible and then engages the external framework of accountability. That's the equation. You have to get the balance right here where the left-hand side is the dominant side as a combination. You can't cherry pick here, incidentally. It's all four of those things that have to be integrated. Uh, this in our kind of change cycle work uh, is the way I see the lean startup for us. It's just an abstract model, so I'm not gonna dwell on it. But I think what we're all engaged in is directional vision. It's got good passion, good substance in it, but it is directional. We're going to get there by focused innovation, doing it and learning from what works and what doesn't work. And we're going to make assessments as we go through this, uh, through this process. Uh, before I turn it over to you, I want to uh, visit our professional capital work that Andy and I did a couple of years ago and has now really, I think, centered the work of this. This is about the professional capital of the teaching profession, which I include school principals and you. Uh, there are three capitals we have here. Let me talk about them uh, briefly. Human capital, as you see, quality of the individual. Certainly one individual can do heroic things against a lot of odds, but you can't depend on that for, t for everybody or for very long. You can't depend on it. Social capital is way more powerful, and I'll give you a quick example in a moment, and we'll leave decisional capital just to uh, the end. Social capital, uh, quality of the group. Carrie Leanne, who's a business professor at University of Pittsburgh, has been studying social capital in schools for the last uh, uh, 10 years. And this, she typically measures three things. I can name you t 10 different studies. Names three, uh, identifies three things. Gets uh, uh, human capital, re resumes of teachers in the school, and say, what are the quality of these individuals in terms of their, um, in terms of their qualifications? Second, social capital. She asked teachers this question. To what extent do you and other teachers work in this school in a collaborative, focused way to improve the learning of all students? So if a lot of people in a given school said, yes, that's the way we work here, Social capital, she said. And then the third measure was a math achievement over the course of a year. You see where I'm going here. Yes, individual teachers got better results if they had higher human capital. But by far, by far, the biggest impact was the school that had social capital, uh, but biggest results. And also teachers with lower human capital who happen to be in schools with higher social capital also got better in the course of the year. See where it, this is going? Why wouldn't they? They're in that uh, group that's, uh, that's learning. We almost stopped in the book there. We said, is there anything else? And we said, well, probably there is because we're looking at professional learning communities, which are a version of our interest in collaboration, but we're seeing a lot of superficiality. People are having meetings and they're calling them PLCs, but they don't have the rigor that is about implementation. And I would say, if you look closely at the districts that are in this uh, set of 16, they've got rigor of implementation. That's what distinguishes them. They don't have just the right policies. They have, and don't, don't have just the right visions, even the right passion. They have rigor of implementation. So we said, Andy and I, I reflected this way. We said, what if uh, teachers who were less than highly effective were teaming up to learn each other's less than highly effective methods? That's social capital, but it's not very good social capital. So we're to say, that's not good enough. So decisional capital is rigor. Decisional capital, any profession has it. They use data. They, they look at, uh, they look, they, they operationalize, they use data in re relation to individual personalized needs of students. They get very good at making judgments, expert judgments. They have me me uh, mechanisms to do that, and that's, what, that's why they're uh, so powerful. Uh, so let me uh, just say one more thing, and then I'd like you to uh, just do a little reaction for a few minutes uh, with the person beside you, and then we'll open it up. Uh, when you think about uh, digital, and the, I want to compare now in two instances the role of the infrastructure and the role of the day-to-day -day practice. And take digital, and a lot of people have tried to uh, 
a shortcut the, to the future by buying the stuff, as I said. But when you step back from it, you know that certain things have to be done. You need an infrastructure of powerful bandwidth. You need uh, uh, equitable access to devices. You need a whole bunch of things that only the system has the resources to do that. So I'm going to say at the front end, I'll put it simply, the first half of moving in this way is to make sure you get that right and keep investing it. But as soon as you think you've got it, you should switch horses. And the rider becomes pedagogy and achievement, chasing digital, not the other way around. That's the change. The same for student information systems. Let me talk about CCSS. I won't talk about it in detail. It will collapse under its own weight. I said that three years ago. And, but it doesn't have, it's got good things in it. It doesn't have to be collapsing because what you need to do as you build the student information systems is to, that's the infrastructure, is to change horses so that pedagogy is chasing student information, not the other way around. So this is where we get to it. So let me, uh, let me just say to you, uh, ask you to, uh, the person beside you, could be three people, uh, these two questions. The flip, the one side of the coin is this. What idea best resonated with you in terms of what I said? So that's the plus side. And the flip side is what question mark is foremost on your mind given what I said? So the first, time, first one we sometimes call the aha list, what resonated. The second one we call the worry list. What about questions? Take about four minutes, person beside you, name one or two things, then I'm going to open it up. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Excuse my hair. Sorry, I was just going to check. Do we have more than one mic, a roving yeah. mic? Um, have two? Me and Jason. Okay. Over here, where would you, is it best if like, we're on the sides of the room? It's best that if you spread out from each other so yeah. that when I point to someone, I'll give you time yeah. to get there. I'm thinking I might be able to see better from yeah. over there. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, hi. I think, yes, congratulations. I'd like to maybe check with the calendar. I'd love to invite you to come out, maybe speak in August in a leadership retrieval. Okay. Your message might be very similar. You're busy. Yeah, we'll talk. Okay. Hey, good to see you again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, come back together, full group, please.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's hear from you. Uh, we have uh, three uh, roving microphones, and so we'll, you'll need to use that just because of the size of the room. I want to start with the plus side, things that resonated, and so we'll inv I'll invite you to raise your hand in a second to do that. Uh, keep it short, one or two key points that you want to make, things that resonated. We'll do three of those, then we'll mix it up with questions as well. So what resonated? Raise your hand, we'll find you with a microphone. Anywhere in the room. I know you're all shy, but I still wait time applies. Okay, right here, we got, right here? Sorry, Ken. Just identify yourself and, and give us your point. Hi, uh, Dan Kaufman, Prince George's County Public Schools in Maryland. Um, we talked about the John Hattie slide and the difference between teacher facilitator and teacher's yeah. activator. And for me, and I think for a number of the folks at this table, it was sort of a wake-up call um, that we often throw out these terms like inquiry and project-based learning and, and think that those are cutting edge. But when yeah. you look at the, the difference in effectiveness, um, clearly there's a, there's a major difference between the teacher taking on a more passive role just, and just yeah. using digital tools versus being more active. We did have some questions about you know, what exactly do some of those terms mean and why is you know, one, right. in, in, in the, one of the categories versus in the more effective activator category? Good, that's a good question. It's a, and that slide is a point of departure, if you like, and what, what is required in there, we have some answers, but what is required is I wanna say the rigor part of it. So engagement, for example, uh, on the part of students is not necessarily a measure of whether they're learning anything. The rigor is what is the actual learning experience and what is it linked to in terms of a measurable impact. And we are preoccupied with getting precise about the rigor, not to be prescriptive, but to be clear and impactful. That's the reason you want to be precise. So you have to, in a change leader sense, have to up the transparency and the precision and play down the early judgment because the judgment gets in the way. So I didn't answer your question, but it's a damn good start, right? Okay. Uh, but we have more, that's our agenda. So we have a big agenda. Let's have a couple more on the plus side. Uh, here, we got a microphone, please, yep. I hate to point, but it's the only instrument I have right now. Okay. Thank you. So we, uh, is this on? Uh, if you start, it will. Oh, well, okay, I'll start. So we were struck by, no? Uh, it's, Maybe it's not on, sorry. Usually they activate. I'm on. Okay, okay, maybe it's just me. So we, not yet. So talk about technology, right? <laughs> so we were struck by the coupling between the digital opportunities and the facilitation and the role of the instructor. Yeah. And that sometimes these opportunity or these resources can be sort of a quick fix or shiny and new yeah and that it's much more powerful to get into the role of the instructor and the relationship in terms of developing yeah. and implementing over yeah. time and and you, when you just look at it on, at the superficial level it's a lot easier to be attracted to the shiny object and to roll up your sleeves and figure out the pedagogy and we Terry and I were with Cozen uh, two days ago in Atlanta and these are all the tech, techie people and the whole agenda was, with them, from our point of view, was it's not about the technology. Yeah. The technology is an accelerator and deepener, but if you don't get the pedagogy with rigor tied into collaboration, you can't go anywhere with this. Yeah. And that's your point. So a question yeah. would yeah. be, what are some of the specific opportunities or resources that you found that has worked to move that social capital and so one, there's the excitement on the shiny act, uh, new yeah. technology, but there's also some fear sometimes with some of our educators on how we do this and how we make it work. So what are some okay. specific tools? That so you, you notice use? that she slipped in the other side of the question, right? In a not so <laughs> subtle <intentional>. way. <laughs> uh, yeah, these, this is our agenda. And I want to say about the, uh, the social capital uh, that uh, California just happens to be a place where from top to bottom, they've rejected the wrong drivers in the last three years, and everybody endorses the right drivers. The question is how to do this. And that almost every district that I know of is using the principle as a study book to figure out how to develop human, uh, social capital along with human capital. We're studying four districts right now in uh, California on the three dimensions of human, social, and decisional capital to get more clarity. We developed an instrument of 15 items for each of the three dimensions and a set for teachers and principals about how to do that. So the big agenda is to mobilize 
the social capital part, to put it this way, social capital causes human capital better than the other way around, but once you get it, it's a two-way uh, street. Uh, to put other things to it, uh, uh, talented schools improve weak teachers. Talented teachers leave weak schools because they don't want, they want to be around people who aren't going to get some success. And so you really get a, a lot of, uh, so what we have underway now in lots of places is people who have said, and they've, they've, if they've been successful, they already know this, we've only given them a good language and a focus around it, that we're getting somewhere because we've mobilized purposeful uh, social capital with decisions and ideas. And so that's what is being done. The pedagogy then is part of parcel of that. It's still the early days of getting it really clear. And the, so I think of it as a learning period. The most important thing in a learning period is to suspend judgmentalism because it gets in the way of learning. And you, and you get, you, in return for suspending judgmentalism, you get transparency and precision. Transparency and precision is a better accountability mechanism than false, uh, you know, than false uh, external accountability, which is not really uh, taking hold anyways. So all I want to do today is to say this is the agenda. You're identifying with the agenda. We have work to do, and if you do this work together, individually and together, you will map out the things we're talking about. And we'll do our part. We write about it a lot. We have a book coming out in the summer called Coherence, uh, the, the Four Right Drivers in Action. So we do our part because we get it from you. But I know that the connection with you is going to make it even more powerful. OK, a couple more, either questions or things you liked. Go ahead. Hi, Aaron Trummer. I'm Apex Central School District, New York. A uh, couple of points, uh, and we're flipping the both of them, the positive, uh, the redefinition of collaboration. Uh, I think it comes out strong when you talk about lateral uh, movement between districts, yeah. between schools, and between the state, and how that is redefined with the de defining rigor, having the social capital, et cetera, within those groups. Question. With the current political environment that is driving the external, quote, definition of what those relationships mean and what that word that I just absolutely cannot wrap my mind around, accountability, uh, is coming from political agendas, how do we work in developing that uh, appropriate relationship and that lateral collaboration? Okay, that's a great question, and uh, uh, I won't just say we're working on it, but I'll say how. That is, if you're in a jurisdiction that has external accountability the wrong way, which is actually most of you, <laughs> if you're in that jurisdiction, you can still, you still have leeway to promote the lateral learning strategy I described within your district for sure. In other words, if you want your district to be strong, you have to have networks of schools working with each other where principals collectively get better and more powerful. And they talk back, and that's what you want, but they talk back within a framework of development. So you can build that, no matter what the state system is, you can beat the state at its own game by doing that. When you do that, and we've seen districts do that in California in the bad days, uh, Garden Grove, Long Beach, or just two of them, Sanger, three of them, and they all did it, even though the, the wrong external environment was there of policy. They did it by figuring out how to avoid useless compliance and get away with it. You, get away, you avoid it and get away with it by doing good things and you build up your success rate and your linkage with your community and your parents. And you get political power from that. So it's an uphill battle, granted, but you can do that. And uh, that's key. The second thing is, we begin to look at instances of states shifting in that direction. We are getting more, uh, and California is one, but it's not the only one. In the last three months, uh, we are, and we're linking up with two states that I'm not going to elaborate on, where the superintendents are saying, we want to take advantage of this uh, lateral learning in our own districts and with each other, and we think we have some connections at the, uh, at the state level that are more favorable now than they were the last four years. And therefore, we want to go and push that agenda as well. So this is a big agenda. The only, thing I can, the only other thing I can say about it is the external accountability system that you're combating does not work. So the evidence is pretty clear. You get more accountability 
by the strategy that I mentioned than any external accountability system around. More actual accountability. So that's what should keep you going. That, uh, we did a paper, you can, it's just on our website or you can probably download it. Professional capital as accountability. Just released a month ago. Professional capital as accountability. Where we said, take our professional capital, implement it this way, including internal accountability, and you will have all the accountability you could ever want. So I don't think it's just an easy to give the argument to politicians and say, please believe us. But I think the action is on our side now, and you should go for it, even if it's, uh, even if it's a problem. It's not your job to implement government policy. It's your job to exploit it. <laughs> exploit it for the best possible reasons, and you will get professional power and political power. OK, one more I think we have time for. Yes, right here. Proximity does work. Uh, wait for a microphone, though. Uh, yeah, we've got, we, behind me, okay, behind you. So I do understand the connection between um, good peda pedagogy and using it in a way that the pedagogy follows the technology. But I guess my biggest worry is the t overcoming teachers' fear of using technology and administration not insisting that technology be used to improve pedagogy. For example, we had a program that was instituted maybe um, three or four years ago. And that program was to be used to help improve pedagogy. I'm not sure what area. So this budget season, we evaluated how many licenses we have for that software. So there may have been like 20, 25 licenses, but we found that only one license was being used. So what um, caused uh, our teachers and our staff to consider that they wanted to use a software uh, for the purpose that they thought it was intended for, and then what limited them to stop using the software. Okay. I felt one of the issues was that there was no accountability. But if there's no, no if you're not insisting, if we're not insisting that people or teachers use the, um, the program and hold yeah. them accountable, how do we know it's working? Yeah, so that, I mean, this, these are all big, complex questions, and I have to be brief on it before the hook comes out. Uh, and, uh, and here's the answer. The answer is you have to tap into the intrinsic motivation of the teachers, not their willingness to adopt some foreign object, uh, uh, such as uh, technology. And on our website, we, and we've seen this, this is not, these are not schools we're working with. These are schools that popped up spontaneously. The, the schools that, like Park Manor or uh, uh, several others we have on there, where they started at time one, teachers were afraid of technology. The, the principal said, this is a learning proposition. We're going to focus on pedagogy. I'm going to be a learner. I'm going to be comfortable in front of you saying I don't know how to do things. I want you to be comfortable in front of each other and your students. And you open it up. You reduce the fear of change in, res in response for we will help develop capacity. And then you mobilize students to help teachers on the technology side, which is free labor again. Sorry to say it that way, uh, but that's the case. And you, they, they will get hooked on it because of the quality of the pedagogy and the, uh, and the learning experiences that students start to demonstrate, and then it will go like wildfire. I can say without, uh, without any hesitation at all, every case we've looked at, it's been time one with teachers individually in their own classroom, afraid of technology, and then two years later, three, uh, beginning of the third year, positive contagion, and you couldn't stop them from doing more. It's hard at the beginning, I agree with you, but this is how it's done, and it's doable, and when you, uh, when you unleash it, you get enormous power. Thank you very much, everybody.